they're so well behaved. <laughs> uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, just to remind everybody, we have a hybrid program this evening, so I just want to say a few notes. First of all, I'm Todd Tabutis. I'm director of the Art Museum of WVU. Welcome. We're glad to have you here on such a lovely evening after daylight savings time has changed. Um, because it's hybrid, uh, folks are watching out there in uh, internet land uh, on YouTube with a live stream. So uh, what that means is they won't be able to hear any Q&A at the end. So we're kindly asking that if you do have a question for our speaker, if you would come up to the mic and pose your question uh, uh, after, the, after the talk, that way everybody uh, watching on YouTube can hear it as well. For folks who are watching on YouTube, you can drop your questions in the chat and my colleague Heather Harris will uh, feed those questions to Michael here while we're going uh, during the Q&A. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Michael Sherwin, who is currently Associate Professor of Art in WVU's School of Art and Design in the College of Creative Arts. Using the mediums of photography, video, and installation, Michael's art reflects on the experience of observing nature through the lenses of science, popular culture, and history. He has won numerous grants and awards for his work and has exhibited widely, including recent shows in West Virginia at the Clay Center for Arts and Sciences, the Huntington Museum of Art, as well as at the Morris Museum of Art in Augusta, Georgia, and the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center. Reviews and features of Michael's work have been publicized in Art Papers Magazine, Oxford American Magazine, The Washington Post, and on National Public Radio. Michael earned an MFA from the University of Oregon in 2004 and a BFA from The Ohio State University in 1999. He is an active and participating member of the Society for Photographic Education and is currently the lead instructor for WVU's Jackson Hole Photography Workshop. Tonight, Michael will be sharing his years-long project, Vanishing Point, which was published in book form by Kara Verlag er earlier this year and is available for purchase from Michael tonight after the program. There's several books back there and I think he's expecting not to bring them home. Michael will also discuss his work as a, uh, in the context of the art museum's current display of landscape, paintings, prints, and photographs now on view in the McGee Gallery through December 12th. So with that, please help me welcome Michael Sherwin. All right, thank you. You all, everybody can hear me okay? Thank you so much for coming. Give me just a second here and I'll get set up. Uh, yes, yeah, so I wanna thank Heather Harris immensely for helping pull all this together. Uh, thank you to Todd Tobitis for hosting me and for that very generous introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, I also want to say hello to all those virtual viewers out there. Um, hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Peter in Minnesota. Um, so yeah, a real quick background. Um, I, I was born and raised in, in southwestern Ohio. And uh, I did get my BFA from The Ohio State University. Uh, in 1999, and then I went on to get uh, an MFA from the University of Oregon. So I spent nine years in the American West uh, before moving here and taking the position at WVU in 2007. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, a few of the pieces in the Trees on the Mountain exhibition uh, that is on view now, and then I'm going to uh, segue and talk a little bit about uh, my decade-long project, Vanishing Points. Uh, which, as Todd said, was recently published as a photo book. Uh, before we begin, though, I want to share a, a land acknowledgement video uh, that was created by WVU and released on October 11th, 2021, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. So we'll cue that up right now. The West Virginia University System, with campuses across West Virginia, resides on land that includes the ancestral territories of many indigenous peoples, including the Shawnee, Lenape, Delaware, Haudenosaunee, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, Tuscarora, and Cherokee. By acknowledging this, we recognize and appreciate these indigenous nations whose territories we are living and working on. Indigenous peoples have been of the land currently known as West Virginia since time immemorial. 
It is important to understand the context that has brought our university community to reside here on this land and of our place within this long history. By acknowledging this, we endeavor to always seek the truth about who we have been, who we are now, and who we can become. Who we have been, who we are now, and who we can become. I think this is a nice way to frame our conversation today. And to begin, I want to break down this word persist. What does it mean to persist? These are literal definitions from the Oxford American Dictionary. To continue firmly in a state, opinion, purpose, or course of action despite opposition, setback, or failure. Or to remain or continue in existence, to last, to endure, be prolonged. In terms of the land, I was thinking about how it persists in multiple ways. Number one, as a source of spiritual renewal and reflection. We've seen this throughout history and even more vividly during the past year and a half of the pandemic. Outdoor experiences have provided refuge from the pandemic for many of us. There was a record 237 million visitors to America's national parks in 2020 alone. Some parks saw up to 40% increase in visitation. The land also persists as a repository of distilled history. It contains the obscure and sometimes troubling stories of our past. Landscape art, as seen in the Trees on the Mountains exhibition, both expresses and explores these connections and tensions. It reveals a story of our ever-revolving relationship with the land and the places we call home. Uh, this piece is titled Autumn on the Kanawha uh, from 1864 by William Sheridan Young. Young was originally from Cincinnati and fell in love with the rivers and the mountains of West Virginia. He and I share a lot in common. Um, he also served in the Kanawha Valley uh, during the Civil War and frequently returned after the war to paint West Virginia scenes. And landscapes like this are often depicted uh, as these sort of, are often viewed as these epic depictions of place, but it's in the small details of the scene that you find a larger story. In the background here, you see a group of Civil War soldiers stoking a fire near a lean-to structure. And in the foreground, a man walks carrying a bundle in one arm and what appears to be a rifle in the other. It's as if Young is depicting two stages of his own life, his past as a former soldier, placed further back and less clear, as his future or present self at the time he made the painting walks towards the viewer and away from the trauma of the past. Young also painted at least five views of the Cheat River, like this one here, and several more of the Kanawha River. And one of the other small details I took note of in Young's paintings are the frequent use of two small black birds. In these details from his painting of the Kanawha, there are two pairs of birds soaring through the sky. While in the Cheat River scene, they have come down from the sky and appear to be roosting on a fallen log. Crows, ravens, and blackbirds are typically used in paintings uh, from the 19th century as symbols of death. With his inclusion of figures and symbols such as this, Young seems to be suggesting a larger narrative about the cycles of life and even his own mortality. Young passed away of heart failure at just 41 years of age. And a number of the pieces on display in the Trees on the Mountain exhibition could be considered part of uh, the Hudson River School style of painting. Hudson River School was a name coined to identify a group of New York City-based landscape painters that emerged about 1850. Their style of painting was marked by dramatic forms and vigorous technique, reflecting the British aesthetic theory of the sublime or fearsome in nature. Nature often dwarfs human habitation as you could see in this detail.
Hudson River School paintings also reflect three themes of America in the 19th century, discovery, exploration, and settlement. Optimism, religious destiny, and endless opportunity were all significant themes of the art. In general, Hudson River School artists believed that nature in the form of the American landscape was a reflection of God. Although art provides us with no concrete evidence of the way Americans felt about westward expansion, the repetitive themes of the art suggest a general consensus regarding the destiny of the young, growing nation. Again and again, these same themes appear in American art of the early 19th century. Uh, Michael McCurdy was an American illustrator, author, and publisher known for his trademark black and white wood engravings. The beautiful pieces that are on display in the Trees in the Mountain exhibition were used to illustrate a book titled My First Summer in the Sierra by the famous author, naturalist, and conservationist John Muir. The prints are intended to illustrate Muir's writings about wandering through a vast and empty land. Muir was noted for being an ecological thinker, political spokesman, and religious prophet whose writings became a personal guide into nature for many people, making his name almost ubiquitous in the modern environmental consciousness. According to author William Anderson, Muir exemplified the archetype of our oneness with the earth. In 1890, 1889, John Muir drew lines across a map of the Sierra Nevada mountain range in California to propose a grand idea, enshrining what he saw as a treasure of natural beauty in the form of Yosemite National Park. Except the wilderness Muir called Yosemite was already named Awani, meaning gaping mouth-like place and beloved by the Awanichi people who lived in the valley. Muir's desire to protect Yosemite, which led him to found the Sierra Club in 1892, was not for the benefit of the valley's original inhabitants or even the full pal palette of American diversity. Stanford historian Richard White says Muir's very conception of wilderness bakes in racial bias. Muir's, quote, unblighted, unredeemed wilderness in which the galling harness of civilization drops off was only possible through the erasure of America's indigenous people whose villages and way of life had been destroyed. For Muir, Native Americans, quote, seem to have no right place in the landscape. In similar fashion, Carlton E. Watkins' early photographs of the valley were part of an 1860s United States Geological Survey to determine the lay of the land so they could help eradicate native peoples and assist real estate prospectors looking for the best places to lay down railroad tracks or to construct buildings. Ansel Adams, who also has a piece featured in the exhibition, follows this pioneer legacy of photography. His black and white photos of the American West depict an awesome, pristine, undeveloped Eden, empty of people and even animals. He wasn't averse to erasing a road from a photo if it marred the natural look of it. He was an environmentalist and an activist, and he used his photos to promote his causes. However, much like Muir, he neglected to recognize that the valley he was so enchanted with and that he built his reputation on was once the sacred home of the Awanichi people. The only reason Yosemite Valley looks the way it does in Adam's photographs was due to the forced removal of indigenous people from their ancestral homelands. Ansel once said, quote, I am not afraid of beauty, of poetry, of sentiment. I think it's just as important to bring to people evidence of the beauty of the world, of nature and of man, as it is to give them a document of ugliness, squalor, and despair. In contrast, I think in my own work, I'm interested in that space between beauty and despair and in the larger story of the land. Shortly after moving to Morgantown, West Virginia in the summer of 2007, uh, I noticed some protests were taking place on a, a very busy street intersection, that, which was actually less than a mile from our house. 
and the protesters were objecting to the nearby Suncrest Town Center development. A quick story about this area, um, and the, the article comes, I uh, came to find out years later that it's a lot of, there's a lot of mistakes in this reporting of this article. Um, and the information about the site continues to unfold. Um, but uh, basically the, the, the lease for this land was owned by the university and they sold it to Walmart. Um, this is what I know. And Walmart, in the process of um, excavating the land, they exhumed some skeletal remains. Um, and uh, Walmart has a pretty bad reputation for desecrating sacred sites, so they backed out um, and a local developer stepped in. And uh, in, in Suncrest Town Center was under construction. Um, so basically, the, the landscape was transformed from a sacred indigenous burial ground and village site to a quintessential American shopping center. So in the spring of 2011, again, I lived, uh, we lived less than a mile from this site. I photographed the site at dusk uh, from a vantage point uh, above the bustling scene below. And I've, I've brought the piece here as well, if you want to take a closer look. Uh, but the resulting image seemed to contain uh, an interesting duality to me. It was romantic and sublime, yet it was familiar and banal at the same time. The site had been plowed and paved over, yet the mystery and the story of its past persist. And from that point on, everywhere I looked and every time I stuck a shovel in the ground, I wondered what stories might lie beneath. As Keith Basso describes it in his book, Wisdom Sits in Places, Landscape and Language Among the Western Apache. Quote, when ordinary perceptions begin to loosen their hold, a border has been crossed and the country starts to change. Awareness has shifted its footing and the character of the place, now transfigured by thoughts of an earlier day, swiftly takes on a new and foreign look. So I started doing some extensive research, meeting with historians, scholars, archeologists, and studying maps. On the left here is a map um, by, from the Bureau of American Ethnology in 1884. Um, Smithsonian workers recorded 50 mounds and at least 10 earthworks near present-day Charleston, West Virginia. Today, there's only three that remain. You can see them in, in red here in the map. And on the right is a map of downtown Moundsville, West Virginia, uh, depicting a really elaborate earthwork. And I, what I discovered is that we were living in a landscape that has this rich and fascinating story. And the more I researched, the more I read, the more I wanted to visit these places and learn more and experience them. At 62 feet high and 240 feet in diameter, the Grave Creek Mound, which is in Moundsville, is one of the largest conical type barrel mounds in the United States. More than 60,000 tons of dirt were moved to create it around 250 to 150 BCE, or basically over 2,000 years ago. So yeah, this is located in Moundsville near the banks of the Ohio River, surrounded by a chain link fence, parking lots, and the famous Gothic style West Virginia State Penitentiary on the other side of it. There also used to be a bar at the top, interestingly enough. In addition to the mound sites, I was able to locate and visit a number of significant archaeological sites. Uh, this boat ramp on the Ohio River is adjacent to one of the largest Fort Ancient archaeological sites in the country, just north of Huntington, West Virginia. Fort Ancient is a name for a Native American culture that flourished from 1000 to 1750 CE. It's currently a wildlife management area, AKA a hunting area. I also visited sites of significant tragedies or contested battlegrounds. The Battle of Point Pleasant was fought between Virginia militia and American Indians in 1774. Over 280 humans were killed in the battle. The battle forced Shawnee Indians to cede all claims to land south of the Ohio River, which are today's states of Kentucky and West Virginia. This bench sits in front of a section of a 2,000 foot mural that depicts the history of Native Americans in the area. In this soybean field outside Buffalo, West Virginia sits atop one of the most important archeological sites in the region the Buffalo site, which encompasses at least four time periods dating all the way back to 4,000 BCE. 
Today, it's the soybean field, soybean field planted by a farmer over the river in Ohio, and there's a huge Toyota plant across the street, which you can see coming in on the right edge of the frame there. And one of the allures in visiting these sites is to reach back in time and space, to imagine and experience what the land must have been like hundreds and thousands of years ago. However, nearly every direction you point the camera in today's world, evidence of our modern civilization intrudes. At this site, um, this is just the Ohio River, and I came to the site early in the morning and it was just the river and fog. And in the process of setting up my camera and getting ready to shoot, the fog had risen just enough to reveal this paper factory, I think is what it is, that uh, seemed to be just kind of rising out of the river itself like a mirage. Um, in 2013, I got a grant to, uh, from the West Virginia Division of Culture and History to spend a year following the ancient Ohio Trail. Um, these are maps from the Ohio Archaeological Society circa 1914. On the left, a map of burial mounds, earthworks, and archaeological sites. And on the right, ancient migration routes and Indian towns. In 2007, there were more than 42,000 ancient archaeological sites documented in Ohio. So Ohio was really the epicenter of the native world 2,000 years ago. Yet I grew up there without any knowledge of the state's previous inhabitants. Returning to the landscape of my youth with a new perspective on the spiritual importance of the land was like a pilgrimage for me. This is one of the last remaining ancient conical burial mounds in the city of Columbus, Ohio. Shrum Mound was constructed about 2,000 years ago by the Adena people. Currently, the mound sits in a one-acre park surrounded by a busy highway, privacy fences, an old limestone quarry, and a modern townhome development. But it, it still evokes a mysterious and meditative presence. From the top, you can see the city skyline eight miles away. Burial mounds like this dot the landscape of Ohio, although many have been destroyed by agriculture and development. Perched above the confluence of the Ohio and the Great Miami Rivers, Shawnee Lookout Park was an important observation point and may be the largest continuously occupied hilltop Native American site in the United States. Standing at the lookout today, one can imagine the strategic importance of this site and the protection it offered, while also pausing to reflect on the impacts of modern industry. Railways and roads crisscross the landscape while power plants dot the horizon. This mound and the earthworks surrounding it were destroyed to make way for a World War II military training ground. Before bulldozing them, precise maps were made, and following the, the war, the entire site was reconstructed. So essentially, this is an artificial ancient earthwork, yet it still retains a surreal and otherworldly-like atmosphere. And sometimes I'll visit a site and focus on a specific subject rather than the entire landscape. This stump along the banks of the Great Miami River in southwest Ohio is exploding with shoots of new life. It seemed like a symbol of perseverance perhaps mimicking the struggle for existence that indigenous peoples have faced. And oftentimes there is a rich layering of culture and history at the sites I visit. From 13,000 BCE to 400 CE, indigenous Americans lived along the Licking River in central Ohio and visited the Black Hand Gorge area regularly due to its proximity to the Flint Pits nearby. The rock art and burial mounds in the area were destroyed in 1828 during the construction of the Ohio and Erie Canal. The canal locks have since been abandoned and the site is now a hiking and nature preserve. So this ancient lock that you're looking at along the banks of the Licking River was carved into a burial mound and is now a hiking trail. A visual strata of culture and time in a single image. The Serenity Hills Campground, formerly known as Indian Hills Campground, surrounds a large burial mound with campsites bordering it on all sides. While wandering the grounds, I noticed a makeshift clothesline hanging in front of the ancient burial mound. Numerous white t-shirts hung on the line, some with American flags, 
and another with the words, quote, how can I think outside the box when they won't even let me out of it? The ironic juxtaposition of cultural symbols was laid out in the scene in front of me. I thought about the narrow view of history we've often presented in our public schools, avoiding the Native American stories and perspective of the land. The American flag in particular is a reoccurring symbol in the Vanishing Point series. There's something about unabashed patriotism that I grapple with, especially considering the full history of our country and our treatment of indigenous people. Between 1776 and 1887, the United States seized over one and a half billion acres from America's indigenous people by treaty and executive order. Produced by researchers at the University of Georgia, this time-lapse map shows how quickly land was stolen or ceded. Some scholars estimate that there were as many as 18 million natives in North America pre-contact. There was an estimated 88 to 90 percent decline in Native American population from the time the Europeans landed in 1492 to the lowest recorded value of 228,000 in 1890. Westward expansion of the United States, along with disease, emigration, and warfare, decimated the population of indigenous people throughout this time. Many consider it an American Holocaust or genocide brought on by the American government. Westward, the course's empire is a 20 by 30 foot mural painted by Emanuel Gottlieb Lutz in 1861 and symbolizes Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny, a phrase coined in 1845, held that the United States was destined by God, its advocates believed, to expand its dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the entire North American continent. Lutz combined pioneer men and women, mountain guides, wagons, and mules to suggest a divinely ordained pilgrimage to the promised land of the Western frontier. The dark turning into the light represents how many people believed in a greatness that lay before them in the future West. As I mentioned earlier with the Hudson River School paintings, this was imagery as familiar iconography of the time. This is the Sherwin family version of Manifest Destiny. Uh, my childhood was defined by a lot of road trips, my childhood and my college years, a lot of cross-country road trips and family adventures. Uh, there are four children in my family, that's my father in the driver's seat there and our wagon we called Brown Betsy. And my mom is in the uh, passenger seat, um, my older sister in the front, my younger sister hugging my, or leaning onto my father's shoulders. That's me in the back window and my little brother is probably rattling around in the, in the back somewhere. <laughs> Uh, what I, I love this picture. I've loved it for years. Uh, it says a lot about how we grew up um, and the love I have for my family. And, and um, the details in the picture say a lot about my family as well. Um, if you take a look at the, the amount of bikes that are on that roof, <laughs> I think there's probably six bikes on that roof. And if you look even closer, there's a string holding all <laughs> six bikes <laughs> on the roof. No one's buckled up. It was a different, a different generation, and we had fun. But as a, white, as a white male with European ancestry, I realize that I'm complicit in this act of genocide that I'm describing. However, this project is not about white guilt or righting the wrongs of history. I'm merely trying to reckon with my own physical and spiritual presence on the land while attempting to unwind or address our collective cultural amnesia. I didn't grow up with a whole lot of spiritual direction. Uh, instead of Sundays at church, like most of my friends and neighbors, I was often taken on long, rambling hikes through the woods of Southwest Ohio. This is my younger brother, there he is. It was these early experiences in nature that were formative in my life and my spiritual path, and they've led to a lifetime of, of exploring and seeking wild places. This is me circa 2000 in the Wyoming backcountry. When searching for questions of meaning, I identified with theories of interconnectivity in Eastern religions and Native American philosophy and, and in the power of place. 
One of those powerful places that was on the top of my list to visit when I first started this project was the Bighorn Medicine Wheel, which sits at nearly 10,000 feet high in the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming. No one really knows when it was built, uh, but the cultural history of the site dates back over 10,000 years. It was an epic adventure to get to this site and to make this picture. Um, I detail this, I go into great detail in, the, in my essay in, in the Vanishing Points book. Uh, but briefly, I, I had to get up about uh, 2.33 in the morning and I drove for several hours uh, in pitch blackness, um, dodging wildlife the entire way <clears throat> and winding my way up to 10,000 feet in the darkness. Um, and then it's a mile and a half hike. There was no one at the parking lot. It was completely dark. It's a mile and a half a hike from the parking lot to get to the wheel. So I hiked through the darkness. It was maybe a little bit of dawn at that point. Um, got to the site and the light was just coming over the mountains. And it was this perfect golden hour kind of light that every photographer lives for. Um, but I knew that... If I was to like rush to set up my camera, I was going to completely miss uh, the experience of being at this site. And this is really emblematic of the project as a whole. It's about, it's as much if not more about the experience and the adventure and the research and the learning than it is about the photographs that come out of that. So when I arrived, uh, I decided to set the camera down. I walked the full circle of the wheel. Again, I had the entire site to myself. Um, but I noticed all these prayer bundles um, attached to the posts and the ropes that border the wheel. Um, and then there was this one post that had a bald eagle feather, or maybe it's a golden eagle feather, I'm not sure, but it stuck into the top of the post. And it reminded me of photographs I had studied of the great Lakota chiefs and leaders, Red, this Red Cloud and Sitting Bull who often attached eagle feathers to the back of their heads so that they pointed directly above them. Both bald and golden eagles and their feathers are highly revered and considered sacred within native religions. So that was the only picture I made that morning after that entire adventure of getting there. And then it was another mile and a half hike carrying 45 pounds of camera gear and another long drive back. Canyon de Che is one of the longest continuously inhabited places in North America and is considered the sacred heart of the Diné or Navajo culture. The canyon is actually a labyrinth of three different canyons covering over 80,000 square miles and dotted with prehistoric rock art and ruins dating back over 5,000 years. Yet it's under attack by developers and tourism, including a very popular 4x4 guided Jeep tour. On the right side of the image, lower right, uh, you can see the Antelope House ruins, which are estimated to have been built around 700 CE or over 1300 years ago. This large prairie juniper stands like a sentinel above the formidable badlands of Theodore Roosevelt National Park below. The badlands of North Dakota were and continue to be a spiritually significant landscape for a diversity of native cultures. People considered the buttes the homes of many animal spirits and came to the Badlands on vision quests and for other rituals in addition to hunting and gathering. Trees like this are featured throughout the series. Much like the land, they are the silent witnesses of history. And as the project moved west, I, I made stops along my journey at sites that tell the story of westward expansion. Register Cliff rises above the North Platte River near Guarsne, Wyoming. The area was a popular campsite along the Oregon Trail, and many immigrants carved their names and the dates of their passage in the chalky limestone bluff. Most of the inscriptions are from the 40s, 1840s, and 50s, peak years of travel along the trail. The Black Hills, or Paha Sapa, as they are known to the Lakota Sioux, are the sacred heart of their existence as a people. In the Treaty of 1868, the US government promised the Sioux territory that included the Black Hills in perpetuity. 
However, this treaty only lasted until gold was found in the mountains and prospectors migrated there in the 1870s. The federal government then forced the Sioux to relinquish the Black Hills portion of their reservation. For the Lakota Sioux, the four presidents carved in the hill at Mount Rushmore National Memorial are one more violating act of colonization and desecration. The iconic, iconic landscape of Monument Valley has become the symbol of the American West thanks to popular Western Hollywood movies such as Stagecoach. Quote, Monument Valley is the place where God put the West. End quote, that's John Wayne. The irony is that Monument Valley isn't actually part of the United States, but a tribal park on the Navajo Nation reservation inside the states of Utah and Arizona. Much like other iconic landscapes around the world, the myth of Monument Valley covers over the historical and present day struggles of real people. Fort Phil Kearney was an outpost of the United States Army that existed in the late 1860s in present day northeastern Wyoming along the Bozeman Trail. The fort was established at the height of the Indian Wars to protect prospective miners traveling the trail north from the Oregon Trail to the gold fields in present day Montana. The fort's eight foot high walls covered over 17 acres of native land, the largest stockade fort in the West. Bitter from decades of forced removal and broken treaties and opposing the invasion of their hunting grounds, the Sioux Indians attacked the fort viciously. When the Sioux finally triumphed, the fort was evacuated in 1868. It was one of the few instances during the Indian Wars when the army was forced to abandon a region it had occupied. This image of the Crow Reservation lands in Montana depicts two forms of locomotion that have transformed and shaped the history of America, the road and the horse. The scattered sunlight in the hazy sky is a product of one of the worst fire seasons in the American West. So in addition to photographing the landscapes, I'm also collecting objects at the various sites in a series titled Artifacts. I photograph each object in a clinical manner and mimicking archeological findings. I'm interested in what the archeological evidence of our modern civilization reveals about our time on Earth. It's a piece of styrofoam. To further emphasize this sort of quasi-scientific nature of this series, they are displayed in a grid formation. So I'm, I'm literally going to these sites and collecting garbage that's left. And, and, and initially I thought well, this is a good way to kind of pay my respects to the site. Um, and then it dawned on me that what I was collecting was actually, these were artifacts that were something that got to tell the story of our culture, these pieces of plastic or glass or uh, you know, propane tanks. And the artifacts, uh, they add, I think, an interesting layer of archeological investigation to the project that I like. They also add a contrast and a complement to the larger landscape images that kind of broadens the conversation. Normally, I would avo avoid talking about the kind of camera I'm shooting with, but with this project, the camera is an important part of the process and the actual content of the work. The camera I'm using is a large format Wista field camera, and I, I brought my camera with me. It's set up in the back there if you want to take a look after we're done here. Um, it's a fully manual camera. Uh, not, not much has changed since the uh, birth of photography in the mid-19th century. Um, I'm shooting just one sheet of four by five film at a time. I might be at risk of sounding a little cliche, but for me, there's still something really special about shooting film and using a fully manual camera. Here's a quick look through the ground glass of the camera. It's what they call the, the back of the camera. The image is always upside down and backwards, which makes things interesting in terms of compositional arrangements. Of course, that's the image of the eagle feather that we just saw earlier. And here's a whole bunch of ground glass photos. So I kind of became obsessed with images of the ground glass and uh, they became my, uh, took over my Instagram feed. <laughs> um, 
I don't know what it was, but it's sort of a window into uh, what I was, my composition. Um, but the camera also became this sort of like anthropomorphic or alien-like figure in the landscape. Um, this appendages with the tripod and its weird head. It's a really long methodical process to take a single picture with a camera like this. Not to mention the cost of shooting and processing one picture uh, was running me $10 a piece. Um, so it completely changes the way you operate in the field and I thought that was really important with this particular subject matter and this project. It's really precisely because of these reasons, because it slowed me down, because I had to be really selective, that I chose to use a large format camera. It puts me more in tune with the present moment. I feel like I connect with my subject on a more intimate level than I would if I shot everything digitally. I might only take one or two pictures at a site, but I'm fully invested in those images, and I'm spending a lot of time at the site before I ever set up the camera. For me, like I said, there's also something magical about shooting film. Not only does it have a more superior, superior tonal and color range than a digital camera, but there is a lapse of time between the making of the photograph and the final result. It might be weeks or even months before I get a negative back from the lab and finally make a high resolution scan of the image. So my prints are made digitally but I'm shooting everything on film. But it's that long pause between capture and outcome is like a long blank. When I do see the image again, I've had a considerable time to reflect and contemplate on the experience of being in the field. I believe this is a vital process within the work and it informs my editing and treatment of the final image. So here we are, in July of 2021, I published my first major monograph of the Vanishing Points Project with uh, the German-based publisher, Kerher Verlag. A photo book has one of been one of the goals of the Vanishing Points Project since the very beginning. I think it's a great way to share the format of the work and the importance of the project's message. This is um, a short video kind of page through of the book. It's a 172 page hardcover book that includes 87 color images and essays by authors Josh Garrett Davis, Kirsten Rehan, and myself. Uh, it was designed by the amazing Pittsburgh-based designer and artist Alana Schlenker. Um, and you can see the, the book is laid out so that the artifacts kind of appear here and there in sets of two to kind of break up the sequence. We also kind of played around with different sizes. There's two different sizes of the landscape, Im landscape images. And as Heidi knows, there was an extensive period of editing and sequencing that went on uh, behind the scenes. Um, I even made like a, we had multiple dummies, but I took a dummy with us on vacation and that's where the real, the real hard decisions were made. Um, so hard to edit your own work and to figure out what to include and exclude. I mean, there's hundreds of pictures that didn't make the cut even for the book here. Um, but it was a lot of fun to put together and I worked with a great team and there's some great essays in the book. And at the back of this, this three page index with thumbnails for every image and short captions describing uh, the, the literal importance of many of the sites that I visited. There it is. And yes, I have brought copies with me today. Um, and they're signed copies. And I have one of those handy dandy little uh, square reader things. So if you're interested, pick up a copy before you leave. All right, so I'm gonna end with a quote from a famous Kiowa novelist and poet, N. Scott Momaday. To encounter the sacred is to be alive at the deepest center of human existence. Sacred places are the truest definitions of the earth. They stand for the earth immediately and forever. They are its flags and shields. If you would know the earth for what it really is, learn it through its sacred places. 
at Devil's Tower or Canyon de Chez or the Cahokia Mounds, you touch the pulse of the living planet. You feel its breath upon you. You become one with a spirit that pervades geologic time and space. I think there is an ongoing importance to preserving and protecting sacred sites. And in some way, I hope that my work can help be a conduit for remembrance. Thank you very much. don't know my name is Heather Harris and I'm the educational programs manager here um, Michael I really appreciate everything that you brought to the table here and I'm so grateful that when I came up with the wild idea that your book talk should also include some of our gallery work that you were game to weave that in because I think it really um, adds to the story that we're telling that our curator Robert Bridges is telling in the galleries and um, it helps me to see your work in a new way as well. So thank you very much. We are going to have time for q and A. I I do ask, because we are in a hybrid, hybrid format, that if you have a question, you come to the microphone here so that those people who are um, listening at home can hear you uh, and uh, your sound doesn't get eaten up by this cavernous room. So please, um, also, as Todd mentioned, the uh, chat is available on YouTube. There is a bit of a delay, so if you type into the chat, be patient. I will find your comment, and I will read it into the microphone so that Michael can answer your questions. So with that, is there anybody in the room that would like to approach the mic and ask uh, Michael any questions? I feel like the onus of having to come to a microphone freezes people. <laughs> yeah, if you do, if you would prefer to stay in your seat, I'm happy to repeat into the microphone. So um, Mavis mm -hmm. wanted to know more about the camera um, and, uh, yeah. and it's kind of old fashioned sense. So. <laughs> it is old fashioned. Yeah, like I said, not, not much uh, has changed since the, the, the birth of photography. Um, everything's manual. It's, uh, it's a piece of glass in front of a piece of light sensitive material. It's all about changing the distance between that glass and that material. and. Um, you have to control the aperture, you have to control the shutter speed, you control the focus. Um, a large format camera gives you all sorts of control in terms of the focus too. Um, what's unique about a large format camera is that the, uh, the lens plane and the film plane can be moved independently, which means they can be swung, they can be tilted, they can be shifted. Um, so you can, you can get either extreme depth of field or a high range of focus from foreground to background or you can get a really shallow depth of field. Um, and you can do the same thing with the back. You can move the back, the film plane all over. So uh, yeah, I, I can talk to you more about it. Um, I've got the camera here. I, I brought my baby with me and uh, I can, you can look through the back and, and uh, experience it, yeah. It's also, I mean, one other thing I'll say about a, a large format camera is you're looking through a, a, either a four by five, five by seven, or eight, they, they make them eight by 10, even 11 by 14 size view cameras is you're looking with both eyes through the viewfinder. Um, with, with a DSLR or an SLR camera, you're looking with one eye through the viewfinder. So I think that's also kind of a unique phenomenon that I really appreciate is you can, you're using both eyes, you know, and you, you can see that, you can see things differently, I think, in that way. So yeah, I'm happy to show you a little bit more about it. So we do have a virtual question now. Awesome. <laughs> so. Uh, Peter says, thanks, Michael. Go Ducks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, that's not the question. <laughs> Have you been in contact with local or regional indigenous communities about the project along the way of its making? If so, how has your work been received? Good question, Peter. 
Thanks for asking, and thanks for attending. Um, I have had I've had little contact with local indigenous uh, communities, um, and that hasn't been a major incentive with the work. I think what I've learned about the work over the past past couple years more intensely than I started is that the audience for this work is really me and people like me. Um, it's 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 for uh, those of us who, who aren't necessarily aware of the story of the land or who came here first. I am interested, very, very interested and curious about how the work will be received and I hope I do get that opportunity. Um, but I haven't had a lot of opportunity yet um, and uh, I look forward to that though. It's a good question. Hey, hi, Aaron. <laughs> I, I've seen you go through this, through this, this whole, not the whole process, but a lot of it. And it's been great to see. And the one thing that I would want to know to ask you here is um, you've gotten to see all these places. You've gone to all these, these things. Um, what was one or a few? What were the ones that were really impactful? What really? You know, hmm. what did it for you? As as a photographer, I know that there's sometimes you get that feeling when you're there. What were those places for you for this? Mm. What what what's that feeling that you think I had? I don't know. I just that that feeling of being amazed or awe. That, oh that, yeah. That in, that inspiring feeling or yeah. Or or just. You know the fear, the actual um, landscape taking over. I mean, yeah. All of the Hudson Valley painter rhetoric that goes into this. Mm. Um, were there moments that happened for you, or was it was it different? Absolutely. I mean, nearly every one of these were e were emotional in one way or another. And it it um, I didn't talk about this a lot, but the project changed a lot as I moved west. Um, and uh, it kind of, I mean, it just sort of intuitively, I think with the landscape, it was more expansive and uh, really inspirational and wide open. And so I had some experiences at some sites in the West um, that were spiritual, for lack of a better word, uh, where I didn't, you know, there's several that I didn't even take pictures of and I didn't bother. Um, Devil's Tower and Bear Butte and ship rock and these places that are just uh, jaw dropping you, you just unbelievable geological formations that carry some incredible energetic weight and uh, I don't know how to photograph them I didn't attempt to be ironic in my photographs of them I attempted to just try to embody something that I felt there at the site in the photograph itself and some of those failed and some of those maybe succeeded in some small way but um, the, the one that I described it to the, the uh, medicine wheel site. Um, but I remember too, like the first time I saw a mound, uh, actually saw it and recognized it was in South Charleston. And it stopped me dead in my tracks. I was like, holy cow, how did I not see this before? And it was so excited to see it. And it just, you, there could be all this chaos going around, like the Shrum Mound and so many others. It could be suburbs and traffic and four-lane highways, and it's just, it stops everything. It's just this incredible, much like Shiprock and Bear Butte, it, they still carry this really, like, amazing presence. Um, so, yeah, and there, I don't know if that helps answer your question, yeah. but it, every one of the sites carries a story in one way or another. Sometimes those are fraught with, like, anger as well, you know, and... and over the period of time towards the end, it always felt like the images became more and more spiritual. Mm. Yeah. And I, I just. I don't know if that's a coincidence. That you know, I'm just always curious as to how. Yeah. What happened out there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I noticed that too, and I don't know if that's uh, if that could be attributed to the land itself. Um, for me, that the the West has always been. Pulling me. <laughs> I, 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 so much more rich and, and great. Yeah. And, 
Oh, well, thanks. That's, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you. I was definitely, when I was out there, I wasn't, um, I, I got less interested in sort of forcing irony, irony into the pictures. You know, it was just like, take a look at this unbelievable place, you know. So we've had a few more questions in the chat. Great. Um, what was a place that surprised you or that you didn't expect? So you talked about the surprise of the mound in South Charleston, but I don't know if there's another, something that surprised you. Hmm. Um, gonna have to think about that one. <laughs> Surprised or didn't expect. Can you go to the next question and sure. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of <laughs> brainstorm that one? Sure. So Audrey would like to <gasps> you to elaborate on the significance of some of the artifacts appearing to be similar to rocks or other natural materials. So I guess the man, the human made artifacts, I guess, seem similar in texture or uh, mm -hmm. configuration to hum to uh, natural materials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I, I, I think they, they, um, they carry time with them in, in the same way that a rock or a stick or an organic material does. They've been weathered by time um, and by the elements. So I could see that's an interesting observation that I never actually paid attention to, but thank you, Audrey, yeah. <laughs> they, 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 in and of themselves, they embody time in some way. No, I'm still thinking about the surprise. So in sp continuing on this theme of, of time, after working on this for so many years, was there a moment when you knew that the project was at a place of completion? Um, when I made a book, that's when I knew <laughs> it was, uh, that was the only way to slow it down and to put, literally to put uh, bookends on the project. I had to wrap it into book. I don't know if it's done. I, I feel like it is, but there, I mean, it's just tip of the iceberg, you know, and, and there's so many other places that I've been pulled to, but, um, it felt like it was the right time to kind of pause and reflect. Uh, so yeah, I guess I, I guess that that was <laughs> that's that's how I paused. That's how I stopped it for now. <laughs> was the book? Are you surprised yet? Have you thought of? This I, I'm still. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think. There's been so there's so many photographs and so many years of photographs. I'm trying to I'm trying to find the perfect one, and I probably yeah. never will. But <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm for for me just making this picture that I brought here today of Suncrest Town Center was, you know, I, I guess I hadn't shot with large format in, in probably a decade or more. Um, and so I set up the camera and I made that picture and I really didn't think that much of it. I didn't know that this was going to be a 10 year long project. So I guess looking back on that, I think the picture did kind of surprise me and it sort of won me over and I thought, oh, maybe there's something here, you know, and one thing led to another and here we are 10 years later. <laughs> um, so you spoke to this a little bit when you were answering Aaron's question, but I didn't know if you wanted, and I'm, I'm processing where this might have fallen in the time delay. Um, but Kristen uh, says, have you had any standout spiritual moments while visiting one of the sites? So <laughs> you, you, you touched on that a bit, but. I yeah, yeah, people are really interested in my, in my <laughs> spiritual moments, um, which is cool. Uh, I mean, so, so many, um, I think it's, it's hard to single out one. I think the, um, the experience that I, I articulated uh, at the medicine wheel uh, was, was probably one of the most profound experiences. Um, but uh, there were so many others too um, that, you know, oftentimes I'm, I'm, I'm setting up these situations for these photographs where I want to be alone. Um, oftentimes I don't want anybody there in the picture and sometimes I can't avoid it. But I think, you know, reflecting on this project, I think that that's, I was trying to set up moments in my life to have a spiritual experience. It wasn't, like I said, as much about making the perfect picture as in setting up those moments that I had had throughout my life to kind of touch something that was sort of intangible, something that felt magical to me. So, and I've done that throughout my life. And this was just another, this project is another kind of artifact of that. Um, so e each and every one of these photographs, I think there's some aspect of that in them. 
um, and many that you don't see and many that never were photographed as well. Wonderful. Um, so there's one more question in the chat, but we also have just a few more minutes, so I wanted to make sure I left some air and space if there was any, any other in-person question um, before we have kind of a conclusion, qu concluding question from the chat. Yes. <gasps> that's the same question that's in the chat. What's oh, next? Tell, oh <laughs> tell us more about where to next, which I think is a great conclusion and we've got it in stereo now. Yes, what's next? The, uh, the, I always get this question and I, I think I have an answer for you, but um, I'm not entirely sure either. Um, like I said, I think this project is, is over, at least for the moment, but it seems to, as, as all artists know, one thing leads to another. And I'm, I'm, um, I think what I'm interested in now is just a trajectory of this particular project. So I've been traveling abroad a little bit more. Um, so I've had a chance to go to Ireland and to uh, France recently, and I actually teach courses over there. I'm building a course in Ireland, but I've been kind of really enchanted by that landscape. Uh, so I think things are, things, things may be going in that direction. Um, the land, I mean, space and land for me is everything. Um, and so there are particular spots, places, for example, in France and Ireland that I visit that I want to go back to. That's all I know right now. I don't know what the project looks like, but, um, and there's other things that are on the back burner that have been on the back burner way too long that need to be moved to the front of the oven that um, I'm hoping to get to now that this is out in the world. Well, thank you again. Thank you for your time, for your generosity, for, um, for collaborating with the museum. I think this was a really um, wonderful experience for everyone. Um, as we said, Michael will have books in the back. The gallery will also remain open until uh, 7.30. So if you'd like to go in there and find those little birds or the little soldiers, <laughs> <laughs> you can head over there for the next half hour. Our, our student workers will be there staffing it. And we appreciate everyone being here tonight. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.